They've roamed the world to photograph natural beauty, while some of their best work has come from our own state of Illinois. These naturalists have brought their own knowledge of and love for nature to their photography and writing. They continue to delight us by showing us the infinite variety of the natural world and guiding us to better appreciate it. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the work of Dr. Michael Jeffords and Susan Post. Hi, welcome to Art Now, a program where we talk to artists whose work is part of our community. I'm Pat Salmon, and I'll be your host. Our guests today are naturalists Dr. Michael Jeffords and Susan Post, who are, the, who are also photographers and writers. Married for more than 30 years, this couple recently retired from the Illinois Natural History Survey. Dr. Jeffords is an entomologist, and he served as the education slash outreach director of the survey. Ms. Post worked as a field biologist. Both are freelance photographers, with Dr. Jeffords being the staff photographer for Illinois Steward Magazine. They have co-authored three books, Illinois Wilds, Exploring Nature in Illinois, and Field Guide to Illinois Butterflies. And Ms. Post also authored Hiking Illinois and was the staff writer for Illinois Steward Magazine. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to be coming to you from the Cinema Gallery in Urbana which is presently showing some of their incredible photos of birds from around the world. Uh, we'll talk about this show a little bit later in the interview. I'm going to start with this first question. Um, because you've spent so much of your careers documenting Illinois, are you actually originally from Illinois? Uh, yes, I grew up in central Illinois, uh, between Bloomington and Peoria, in a small community called Mackinac. Oh. And I came to school here at the University of Illinois, and I never left. Me too. <laughs> How about you? I grew up in far southern Illinois on the Ohio River. Uh, I could throw a frisbee and it would land in a river from my house. And I came to here in, in the 70s as a grad student and never left either. OK. Uh, you've also traveled quite a lot, though, in your careers. Uh, what are some of the places you visited and photographed? Well, we just returned from the Falkland Islands in South America for a month. Uh, we've been to Peru to Machu Picchu and the Manu National Park, which is the world's most biodiverse park. I've been to Mexico, see the monarchs, Australia, uh, Africa, and we're heading back to Africa this fall again. But we also have done a lot of traveling in the United States. I mean, we've gone to Yellowstone, there for a while we were going to Yellowstone every other year. Uh, we've done the Sequoias in California. Uh, we also like the desert southwest. So. We try, you know, we also try, we don't slight the U.S. Okay. Uh, what led to you becoming naturalist? For me, it was uh, a, a cecropia moth. When I was nine years old, I found one in my hometown, and yeah. that was forever hooked. I started collecting insects, and it eventually ended up at the University of Illinois in the 70s as a graduate student in entomology. Uh, mine also, it was an insect. Um, I had a 4-H project. I wanted to belong. I grew up prior to Title IX. And in, before Title IX, you had a boys club and a girls club for 4-H. If you wanted to join the boys club, you had to have boy-like projects. I had it. My mom suggested, well, why don't you do entomology? That'll be fun. I had an entomology project in 4-H for over 10 years. When I came to the U of I, I first thought vet med, but I really didn't like animal physiology, so I decided, oh, entomology. And that, you know, with entomology, there's so much you can do. And we were always out in the field, either looking at sites or, you know, doing field work, so yeah. it's, it's great. All right. Um, how did you develop your photography skills? With difficulty, <laughs> it's a lot of learn. It's a lot of trial by error. <laughs> yeah, I came, when I came to the U of I, my thesis advisor was an insect photographer, and so I started photographing by kind of mimicking him, uh, Dr. James Sternberg. And when I met Sue, she wasn't much interested in photographing insects. She was more into plants and landscapes. So 
And it's, it's interesting because I, one, of, one of the first times I saw Michael's photo, photographic work, he had a, a, an exhibit in the Illini Union Gallery. And I, my friends were down from high school and I'm like, man, I really wish I could do that. And a couple years later, we both were working for the same person. I had a car, he had camera equipment, and I had bought the same type of camera so I could share lenses. And that's how it started. So, you know, we could go out and we just started photographing. But like he said, I concentrated on plants because he'd already did insects. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, look at some of your photos now. Uh, these first are going to be some of your landscapes. Uh, this one is of Burden Falls. Anything you'd like to say? Uh, yeah, well, photographing waterfalls is, is great. You know, you tripod and you get nice filmy water. Photographing waterfalls in Illinois is a challenge <laughs> since it's just a great corn desert. So uh, there's a few places in Illinois where there are waterfalls. Most of them are in southern Illinois and the Shawnee Hills. And this one is embedded deep in the Shawnee Hills. Great. This, this one is of Moraine Hills. Uh, sometimes it's, it's nice to take simple things and just layer them and, and, and to show. When you take a photograph, you basically put a box around something and then you have to work within what's in that box. And I really like this photo because it, it just shows the layers of the landscape. It's, it's Northern Illinois. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, this is from Garden of the Gods. Oh, the signature, the signature Garden of the Gods. You can see Camel Rock. Um, one of the neat things about Garden of the Gods, if you look, you cannot see any man-made structures within you know, your scope of vision. You can look in all four directions and see nothing but forest. And that's, yeah, that's unusual in a place like Illinois. Yeah. OK, this is Horseshoe Swamp. Well, I grew up not, not too far from here, so I was kind of a swamper and yeah. you know, roamed around. And, and I love the, the landscape here because you can, it's the bald cypress, and you can see that the river floods every year. You can see the, the water line, and it's just a very primeval-looking landscape. OK. And this is another swamp one. This is Tupelo Reflections. Oh, that's from one of our favorite places. I believe that's from Mermet. Mm -hmm. And it's right out the car window. Uh, we go to Mermet quite a bit. It's a wonderful wildlife drive. And so we see this scene. It's always changing through the seasons. But yeah, the, the Tupelo, it's, it's he's, I've, I love the far southern part of Illinois, so. Yeah. And this is Heron Pond, and this is a panorama. Yeah, a few years ago with digital technology, you can now take panorama. So this is a 180 degree view of a cypress swamp in Southern Illinois. This is probably one of our favorite places in the world. And it's, it's certainly the most beautiful swamp I've ever been in. So That's great. If you get a chance to go to see Heron Pond, do so. Okay. I mean, Heron Pond, we can go to Heron Pond every day and there's usually something different going on. That's great. So I love Heron Pond. Okay, and here's winter snowstorm. This is really striking. You got to remember that e even though Southern Illinois is a very southern landscape, it's still in the middle of the continent, so it still has four seasons. So you get to see four seasons of of uh, habitat in, in 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 a very primeval-looking landscape. And this is a phenomenon called ice lensing. Oh, you can okay. see that they're hex hexagonal yeah. pictures are uh, formation. That that's a yeah. phenomenon of the of the North Woods, but it happens when the conditions are just right. Okay, and this is Flower Slope. Yeah, this is a, a local area, uh, Lodge Park, which is not oh, far from here, which sure. is in a quarter of a mile and about 50 feet wide strip. It's got the best wildflower display in Illinois. Ooh, and I'm gonna have to check nobody that out. Ever, <laughs> nobody ever sees it because they don't go down the hill. Yeah, spring wildflower display. Spring wildflower Sure, display. sure, yeah. And this is uh, Cave Creek Glade. Okay, uh, this is a, a prairie, but it's in far southern Illinois, and it's on a limestone outcrop overlooking the Cache River Valley. And then about now, about mm -hmm. June, uh, the whole top of the hill just explodes with cone flowers. Oh, wow. It's, it's even stops traffic sometimes. You see people stopped on the busy highway looking up. That's fantastic. Okay, now we're going to look at some of the more close up ones you've taken of flowers and insects. Um, I don't know where this one was taken. This is an Illinois prairie. It's a sand prairie, and it's in Green River Conservation Area, which is in nowhere, Illinois, up by <laughs> Lee, County, Lee County, just north of the little town of Ohio. Okay. And if you've had a wet summer around here, the 
prayer in the fall looks like this. This is all Lyatris or wow. Blazing Star. So it's actually in the fall. Mm -hmm. like, well, it's well, like September. September. Oh, okay. It's September. Okay. Around Labor Day. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is bird's foot. This is also a sand prairie species. Uh, right, it can be found. Um, there's a couple sand prairies that we like to go to, either Ayer Sand Prairie, which is up in northwestern Illinois, or also Pembroke Savannah. And that one is located in Kankakee or Iroquois County. But here you're going to get these nice little clumps or tufts of bird's foot violet. And right now we've heard that it's just spectacular at airs. Okay, uh, and then we've got some insects here, these the Halloween pennant. Oh, I'm sorry, it's great spangled. Great spangled for Larry's, yes. This is from um, a favorite butterfly haunt in Iroquois County. And if you're lucky and you get there at the right time, you can see about five, you'll see five different species of fritillary butterflies. Mm -hmm. And so that's really something because the state only has six. So about five of the six yeah. can be seen there. Yeah. Okay, here's the Halloween pennant. Yeah, Illinois has oh, 40 or 50 species of dragonflies, and most of them are the familiar green darn and so forth. But this is a, kind of an unusual one, Halloween pennant. This is one of Sue's photos, and she loves using, treating insects like birds. Mm. Okay. Uh, this is the olive hair streak. Green is not a very good normal color for butterflies. So yeah. this is Illinois' only green butterfly, the olive hair streak. It lives in mostly in southern Illinois and feeds on red cedar. And you see it on limestone or sandstone glades. So if you don't go to sandstone glades, you don't see, see it. Okay. Uh, we just recently saw one two weeks ago when we were down there. They have two generations a year. So you're going to have a, you know, sort of a April, May, and then they'll come out again in around July. Okay. And then we have this nice photo of cicadas. I didn't think you could make cicadas look nice. But <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is if you live long enough, you get to see the emergence of periodical cicadas more than once. Yeah. I think this is my third emergence. I've mm -hmm. seen that this is the 17-year cicada, and it, it was yeah. over in Vermilion County. So hopefully I'll be around for the next one. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was going to stop here and just ask, what kinds of equipment do you use when you go out to shoot? I know it's. I, uh, obviously, it probably depends on what you're shooting, but... Uh, well, first of all, even though we're married, we do not share equipment. You remember that sharing that happened in the beginning? It doesn't that, happen. That doesn't happen, so there's no more sharing. Uh, we each have our own equipment, and we've used Canon cameras and lenses throughout. So it just depends on what we're doing. Uh, we have some really nice telephoto lenses, but we also use a lot of wide angle. and at least for myself, to doing butterflies and insects, I like to use a short telephoto, a 200-millimeter 200, 200 lens, and I use an extension tube, which is a hollow tube, and so that gives me the range I need to work with. Right. Michael uses... Yeah. I, I, you use more yeah. flash for yeah. some things, well, and macro, and... It, well, we're, we're documenting biodiversity, so biodiversity ranges from a millimeter up to feet, so you... Right. you the subject dictates what you do. Right. Okay. All right, let's uh, turn now to the current show, which is at the Cinema Gallery, and it's called An Avian Cabinet of Curiosities. Uh, it's featuring large prints of a wide, wide range of birds uh, from around the globe. But let's take a look at just a few of them. Uh, first one. Uh, when, we, yeah. when we put together this show, we were trying to decide, because we have about 500,000 images, and there was room for maybe 70. So we just <laughs> tried to decide, well, we're going to take a slice of biodiversity. And we took a slice of biodiversity we thought people would be familiar with. I figured a room full of insects is not going to turn people on very much. So we chose birds, and we took, uh, there's what, 10,000 species of birds mm -hmm. in, in the world, and we thought we could take a nice finite number and, and show people the, the cabinet of curiosities of birds that we've right. seen over the years. Right. Okay, this, this first one, uh, where was this shot? This is Michael Mass K in the South Indian Ocean off the Great Barrier Reef. And we were standing in, these are what, round noddies? Mm -hmm. and we were standing in, in a colony of, of 100,000 birds. Wow. And then a couple of the photos in the exhibit are when we were, we had a rubber dinghy going around the island, bouncing around in the surf. And the, those are some of my favorite images because those were darn difficult too. They were hard to get. Hard I would get. imagine. You, you earned them. <laughs> right. This next one is, is a beautiful one of cranes. Uh, yeah. Where was this taken? 
at, uh, over in Indiana, uh, northern Indiana, up at uh, Jasper Pulaski. <laughs> We normally go to, to New Mexico to see the cranes, and most people go to uh, uh, Nebraska. Yeah, the Platte in the Nebraska. The Platte to see the cranes, but there are 40 to 50,000 that show up in northern Indiana every November, about Thanksgiving. Yeah. So you have Thanksgiving dinner, then you drive three hours up and, and photograph the cranes. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> okay, uh, this next one is of a woodpecker. Well, that's from Lodge Park. Ah, um, great. We've had a, we had a lot of requests uh, for different publications. Uh, oh, you know, we need a red-headed woodpecker, red-headed woodpecker, and winter in Lodge is probably the best time to just go out and hike around the trails, um, especially in that, um, that open oak parking area. And it's mm -hmm. the easiest place in Illinois. This is a hard bird to photograph because they're, they're right up in a tree, and yeah. at Lodge Park, it's easy. They come down, look at you, and... That's great. Curious, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, this next one is of a heron in a swamp. Okay, uh, <clears throat> sometimes photographing birds. From, we don't do much blind work. The, 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 when we're sitting in the blind, the, the, the blind that we use for this photo is our car. Mm. So it, this is at Mermet Lake, and you just simply drive around and open the car window, and if you open the door, they're gone, mm -hmm. but if you don't open the door, they're perfectly okay. happy to have you around. That's great. And this is another one of a heron as well. This is in the Pantanal in Brazil, the world's largest wetland, and, and again, uh, from the car window, I think. We were, yeah. You drive this really dusty dirt road for 200 miles. And oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a Kokoi heron. Periodically, they, you know, you would get out and you could take, you know, great scenes of jabiru <laughs> and egrets and things, but yeah. just from the car. Yeah, I was going to ask if you had any particular techniques for approaching birds. I mean. Obviously, you're in your car. <laughs> well, if you're in a car, it's not yeah. much of an issue. Yeah. Uh, low and slow. Okay. Uh, you know, if you're this big hulking beast coming up and looking down on them, they're, they're going to be gone pretty much. Uh, you go to places where they're not hunted, which is yeah. as one of the problems with Mermet is it's also a hunting preserve. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're really not careful there, if they see any kind of movement, I think if you pick up a long lens and point it at them and they see that, they don't know what's coming out the end, you know. So. Right, right. Subdued, co it's best to wear subdued colors, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of blend in. Right. Okay. Uh, these next ones are some of the more exotic birds in, in, that are in the show. This is uh, Isolated Turkey. Yeah, this is from the... Uh, this, this is from near Colic Mule. In the Yucatan. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a, a forest bird, and it's one of the world's most beautiful turkeys. And we have a friend who's... An avid hunter. He spends, spends tens of thousands of dollars trying to hunt these, and you know, we're driving down, the road, down this gravel road heading for a, a Mayan ruin, and there's a flock of oscillated turkeys. Yeah. Okay, and we have a cassowary. Have you, have you seen the, the, uh, the, the uh, what, what's the show with the uh, dinosaurs? Jurassic Park? Jurassic oh, Park. Oh, okay. Yes, Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. This is the uh, avian equivalent of a velociraptor. Oh, wow. It's, it's a... Uh, oh, they're, they're huge birds. They're, they're a little taller than I am. Wait, what's the name? That's what I'm trying to... What? The cassowary? The cassowary, veloc thank velociraptor? you. The velociraptor? Yeah, cassowary. <laughs> but they're as tall as you are, and they have a, a huge foot, and they have this huge claw that sticks out. Oh, wow. And, and for defense, they jump up in the air, and they... Whoa. <laughs> about waist high, so they disembowel their prey. That's, I mean, they're, they're a Great. enemy, so they call them velociraptors. Of, yeah. No that's kidding. in Australia. Okay. This is the crimson rumped toucanet. Oh, um, this was in Ecuador uh, mm -hmm. last summer. We took a photo trip to Ecuador with a, a friend, and this was one of the birds I wanted to photograph. It's one of the few green toucanets, so. Great. We have two This is also in hyacinths? Brazil. Yeah, this yeah. is yeah, the uh, uh, hyacinth macaw, and this is the signature bird of the, of the Pantanal. That's it. Okay. the only place in the world where you can actually see them anymore because the pet oh. industry has decimated most of them. Oh, wow. But this is a conservation story where the local people have decided they're more valuable alive, than, so they actually put up hyacinth macaws, you know, and they're, they're huge birds. Mm -hmm. So they have hyacinth macaw houses and oh, they're, cool. they're proud, so. Very good. You can see large, not large, but flocks of them. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Okay, this is a um, toucan? Toucan, it's a toucan barbette. Mm -hmm. And again, this was seen when we saw the, um, the green toucanette. Um, just, it's a great bird. It was another mm -hmm. one that I really wanted to get a photograph of. This was our second trip to Ecuador, so mm -hmm. we saw this at a preserve uh, by a gentleman called Angel Paz. And this man is remarkable in how he has preserved this bit of farmland and it's, he's made it a bird preserve. And it's, and it's, it's grown up to a cloud forest and he's actually trained the birds to come. So he, oh, wow. it's, it's, so it's an it's a ecotourism thing. Right. He's yeah. making a living. Yeah. yeah. That worked before it was just subsistence farming. So yeah, that's great, and it's protecting the birds. Oh, and after you after you do your little tour with them, you get wonderful ep epinatas that his wife makes. Ah, very good. <laughs> okay, and this is a rufous-tailed hummingbird. Just uh, another Ecuadorian. Yeah, nor humming. normally you use flash for hummingbirds. This is one of Sue's photos, and you don't have to. You just have to be. Well, there are a lot of hummingbirds. I mean, you know, yeah, Ecuador has at least 45 to 50 hummingbirds that you could reg you could normally see. You so. could sit a long time in Illinois before seeing a hummingbird right. fly by that was photographable. But yeah. in Ecuador, the, huh? So geez. this just normal like a robin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of them. Right. Okay. Uh, the colors are very striking in those photos. I wanted to ask if those were digitally enhanced or not. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I figured they'd be Good a question is, that people with, with might get. With digital photography, uh, you have virtually infinite number of controls on every image. And most right. people put it on automatic and push the button and they take with the camera. So everything kind of looks right. generic. Uh, we, we don't do that. We shoot on, on, on creative control and we, every image has, is, is not manipulated, but we use the controls to, to yeah. depict what we see and then this, and we shoot raw. Mm -hmm. And raw simply means you get a, a pile of pixels and then you put it in a computer and you make it look like you remember it looking. And so that's the, is, if that's manipulation, yes, but okay. do, are we making these things up? No. Oh, okay. Well, it's just, I know that the colors in the sky, for instance, in some of these. Yeah. Uh, no, no that's, that's the way the sky was. Okay. And if you put the ocean behind a bird, it's, you know, you, that's just techniques for. Right. Okay, uh, I'd like to briefly talk to you now about your work as authors. Uh, I've worked with you, Susan, on Hiking Illinois. I was actually the editor on mm -hmm. that book. Uh, and I know one, one of the great qualities of your writing is that you can really describe the detail on, on the trail and make it come alive. Um, tell us a little bit about what you like about writing and as well as some of the difficulties it might <laughs> give you. I think my favorite, one of my favorite quotes about writing is from Robert Louis Stevenson who says, I hate the act of writing, but I love the fact that I have written. <laughs> and that's the way I am with writing. It's, I mean, it's a love-hate relationship, but in a lot of my writing, I like to use this quote by Rachel Carson where she says, one way to open your eyes is to ask yourself, what if I had never seen this before? And what if I knew I would never see it again? And so especially for the hiking book, um, these people weren't on the trail with me, so I had to use these descriptive, just descriptive powers. Um, I always carry a three by five notebook and I give talks on the three by, using the three by five notebook and how to document. And so that's, that's basically how I started. That's great. Uh, I know you've co-authored books together. Uh, how do you coordinate your work? Well, if she comes up with a project, then she's the main author. And if I come up with a project, then I'm the main one, and we, we cooperate. Uh, we have very, very different writing styles. Sue likes to have a thousand books around her and all this information and kind of sits in the middle of this pile of knowledge. Uh, I write when I have something to say, hmm. okay. and I just basically sit down and, and write it and then, then worry about fixing it later. Yeah. And if I don't have, if mood doesn't strike me, then it doesn't happen. And, and I for, hate forcing it. And for the um, Exploring Nature book, we also, we cut up all, we had little slips of paper that we cut up all the areas and we drew out, you know, okay. so yeah. you had this like assignment. You didn't get to do your favorite places, you had, yeah. to, do, you had to write. And each one of them was a thousand word essay yeah. or something, so. Uh, now, I, you're, uh, you recently released this new book, uh, Exploring Nature in Illinois. Uh, tell us a little bit about that particular book. Okay, the, the purpose of Exploring Nature in Illinois is, is just that. Uh, we, we want people to, to go out and the age of exploration is supposedly dead. 
Well, it's not really if you, if you go out. We gave a talk the, uh, the other night, and we, uh, about 10 minutes into the talk, we were talking about things people had no idea, they had never seen before, and they were not in their, almost in their backyard. So, you know, we could probably sh tell you 30 places within 100 miles of here that we've never seen people at, and, but it, they're great places, and you just go. You know, so the purpose yeah. of the book is to get you to a place, and here's what you'll see, not what you might see, here's what you'll see, mm -hmm. and then go forth and find it. And unlike the hiking book, where in the hiking book I, you know, would actually sort of walk you along a couple trails, here the discovery, you're doing the discovery. So we give you some sort of hints, well, you, you should see this, you should see this, but we don't, and you, we'll say, well, you might want to go on this trail or this, but we don't actually then yeah. describe a, everything they entry might point. see. It's an entry point to discovery. And it, yeah. and it, it may be a, a park, you know, where you can take the kids and let them play, and, but it may be somewhere that may be a little odd to get to, and you know, you yeah. might not be a little comfortable going, but yeah. it's certainly worth going. That's great. Uh, also, I think uh, you wanted to say a little bit about uh, the new one, Field Guide to Illinois Butterflies. I brought like a little, I brought like a little mock-up of what we hope it'll eventually, it will look like. Yeah. my. Uh, PhD advisor Jim Sternberg was the author of the first one. It was Bowsman and Sternberg, and it, it was in print for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and then uh, Jim recently died, and the book went out of print. Mm -hmm. So instead of just re rehashing and doing that, we decided to start from scratch. And, wow. oh. <laughs> it's been a three-year labor of love. I believe it. <laughs> and we figured out that, that we knew about 80% of what we needed to know, and the other 20% has been accumulated as the project goes on. But it's going to be a great field guide, and it, yeah. it, it's designed to compete in the, the market with other field guides. You know, right. it's, it's one of the natural history surveys field guide series, but it's the, the, the new permutation of it. So it should be out in a few months. Right. Okay, and the other one, the uh, Illinois... Exploring Nature in Illinois, that's already out. Yeah, it's, it's out and available at uh, uh, bookstores. At bookstores, Amazon, okay. you name it. Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks very much. We re I really enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you. Okay. Go out and explore. I'd like to. <laughs> Our guests today have been Dr. Michael Jeffords and Susan Post. The show at the Cinema Gallery will be here until June 14th, so please come out to see it in person. All profits will go to the Illinois Natural History Survey. To see more of their photos, go to www.photojournalingm-s.smugmug.com. And if you want to learn more about wildlife and hiking in Illinois, I would recommend you check out one of their books. We hope you have enjoyed today's show, and we also hope it will inspire you to explore the local art scene and to make your own art now. <laughs>